I'm Joe Tarantino, CEO of Protivity, and welcome to our executive chair series. This is our first virtual interview in our series due to the, uh, the pandemic. And I'm here with Margaret Keene, the chief executive officer of Synchrony. Uh, welcome, Margaret. Welcome, Joe. Th- and thanks for having me. You're welcome. Um, I appreciate having the opportunity to to talk to you today. You know, we have a lot in common, uh, both with our roots in Queens, our educational background at St. John's, and now serving as uh, fellow board members for the university. Um, And Margaret, I thought I would maybe just start off by by first asking you if you can give our viewers uh, a brief background of yourself and how you've climbed to the top of Synchrony over the years. Sure. So as you mentioned, I started at St. John's. So my entry into financial services, well, it happened when I was at the college. Uh, I got a part-time job at Citibank when it was uh, a bad crisis in New York, if you remember, Joe, like 1980-ish, where there was a big financial crisis and they needed collectors. So it was a job that was great because they paid five fifty an hour, which was a lot back then, by the way. Yeah. And uh, you can make your own hours. So uh, I used to work in a Queens office where the, one of their locations were. So I'd go back and forth between the school, in between classes, make my calls, uh, and be able to work up till nine o'clock at night. So it was a great role. And from there, entered their management trainee program, had a number of roles inside of City, and made a big change. Uh, career-wise in my mid-30s. And it really was driven, um, and I like to share this because I think a lot of people are always struggling with work-life balance and family. I I made the decision because I was in a role uh, where I was working 24-7 and realized I couldn't keep that pace with two young children and made a decision to go to GE. Had a number of roles inside GE. Uh, Ultimately was leading this business when GE decided to uh, begin the process of disbanding GE Capital. And I was lucky enough to be the CEO at the time inside GE, and they made the decision to allow me to take the company public. So, you know, I wouldn't say that I had planned to be a public CEO or that was my aspiration. It, you know, it turned out to be that way really by circumstance, to be frank. And, you know, I would say that when I first was told, I was kind of struck by this saying, okay, now I'm going to be a public CEO. How did that happen? (laughs) Um, And, you know, we've been separated from uh, GE and on our own for the last six years. That's great. And uh, I'm sure St. John's would love to take credit for training you to be a CEO and uh, and for me as well. But uh, we both know that from our humble backgrounds, it's, uh, it's a long haul and, and, you have to have a lot of good fortune as well as a lot of good mentors and, and people helping you along the way. And uh, and I know both of us have, have had that. You know, it's absolutely. interesting. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I said, no, absolutely. You yeah. can't get there by yourself for sure. I was going to say the, the, the last time I saw you, we were both in San Francisco uh, receiving awards from the Great Place to Work organization back in March. And um, I think it was the first time I had ever elbow bumped anybody, you know, for uh, <laughs> to for recognition instead of a handshake or or a hug. Um, and so here we are, six and a half months later. Uh, maybe just share share with us how your business and your life has changed uh, in in that period of time. Uh, you know, I'd say two things. One of one of the, and I'm going to tie it back to St. John's. I don't know if you recall the following week, we were at a St. John's board meeting, socially distant, and we're going through kind of the challenges the university was facing of, you know, uh, overseas and bringing kids back. And then there was the whole, like all day long in that meeting was around basketball, right? Remember the NCAA came out and then the governor, I think it was Ohio said they can't play here. And we were in the big East that night and people were actually leaving that meeting to go to the big East uh, games Um, And what struck me in that meeting was really all the challenges the university was facing with, do we open, don't we open, how do we close? I think at that point there was a decision, we're going to close and reopen after Easter uh, uh, break. And, um, you know, I drove home that night from that meeting. I called my HR leader and I said, look, we got to close. I I think you're not going to be able to run an organization like this. So we closed that Friday, March 14th. And what we did was we said we're going to close uh, for all of our um, non-call center folks. So we closed all our offices. 
Um, and we all like walked out of there thinking two weeks we'll be back. I don't know. It's really funny. We talked about this all day. We're like, oh, we'll be back in the office two weeks. Literally within, I'd say, two, three, four days, you know, we really had this conversation around the call centers and said we have to close the call centers down. Now, that is massive, by the way. Yep. And we had always said we couldn't send everyone home to work from a call center. We did have work at home. We had about round numbers, a thousand people who did work at home. Um, but now we're going to 17,000 people going to go home. And, um, you know, I would say it was a, a very quick decision by us. And my team just completely transformed our whole workforce in the working from home scenario where, you know, we have people in the Philippines and India as well in the U.S. now fully work from home. So, you know, the way I would say my life has changed is or my role has changed is I'd say first, as we were going through all this, you know, being calm and being decisive on decisions, I think is really, really critical. The second, I would say, is you cannot communicate enough. And we have been doing a number of, um, you know, events inside the company to make sure people see us, see us as leaders, see that we're, you know, calm, cool and collected. And, you know, the fact that the business is going to continue um, and you just, I would just say you can never over communicate. I think the other big thing that was a big aha, one we really want to hold on to is, you know, we innovated really fast. We, you know, I'd say the one thing that is something for all of us to hold on to is, you know, we'd probably have five, 10 meetings before we would do a work at home situation like that. We had no meetings. We were like, we told our CIO and the head of ops go. And, you know, they were ordering equipment, you know, moving people around. And, you know, we came up finally, you know, as things got settled, we never had a discussion. How much is this going to cost us? You know, how are we going to do that? We just got out of the way. And I think as a CEO, you know, you want a team around you that you trust. And secondly, that you empower. And I think, you know, this trust and empower word that comes out a lot in the Great Places to Work survey, right? But letting their job, I think, was probably one of the the big ahas for all of us. Actually, it yeah. was just people go. Yeah, that's it's great, and you know, I, I'm just uh, as you're talking, I'm just thinking about our situation as well, which really parallels, you know, what you and and your organization have have gone through, and um, you know, I, I can't be more proud of of how Protivity responded. Uh, and our team, you know, in a, in a very similar fashion, very quickly, the week after, uh, March 13th was my last day in Manhattan. I was at the the Big East game that got canceled at halftime when all of the all of the leagues decided that uh, there wasn't going to be any more basketball for the year. And, um, you know, that following week, you know, I, I started working from home and, and our whole team, we, we put in Microsoft Teams just uh, a couple of weeks before that. And that's been our platform for for working virtually for for the last six and a half months, and um, we've had uh, this very similar experience. So it's it's terrific. And you know, the the conversation that I really wanted to focus on today was around values, and you mentioned a number of the values um, as as you just spoke that uh, that really resonated uh, over the last um, over the last six months. And and within Protivity, we have three values that we latch on to um, and their inclusion, innovation, and integrity. And it's the three I's that are in our name. And so we, we tried to make this simple for our people, maybe even more for myself, because as I'm getting older, I can't remember uh, all of the, the words that went into the formation of the word protivity when we started the company 18 years ago was based off of the values that we aspired to to achieve over over time. Uh, but these three um, are, are ones that that really resonate with me and and with our team. And inclusion is the first one. and and I know you as one of the few uh, female CEOs in the country and certainly in the banking and financial services industry, um, and a big advocate for inclusion. Um, what do you think the pivotal factor has been for you in terms of getting to the top of your organization and for creating an inclusive environment uh, within Synchrony? Well, you know, I think you started with it. It's it's really um, 
I think having a, a purpose driven company is where, you know, we've been able to rely on that purpose driven uh, uh, framework that we've built out, which of course includes our values. You know, I think um, when we split out of GE, one, one of the one of the things we took with us was, you know, GE was pretty good at, you know, creating uh, diversity networks and the like, but we actually took it one step further and we have, uh, you know, we have eight diversity networks and we included it for all our employees. You know, GE was only for exempt, not for hourly workers. And we made a big decision when we did that because I think it's really allowed us to really understand kind of from the the bottom of the organization all the way to the top, how important um, inclusion really is. And I, I think, you know, obviously with, you know, you have the pandemic, which was hanging over our head, which was enough to deal with, you know, quickly behind that, we had all of this social injustice that began to really um, emerge. And, and you know, look, I'm, I'm old. I've been around a long time. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I would tell you the combination of those two things have been just um, – explosive for our, our diverse or uh, folks in our organization, particularly the black and brown um, part of our organization and the hurt and the, the deep feelings inside the company have been something I've never seen in my career, to be frank. I've never seen people open up and share kind of what they've gone through. And I, and I, I think, you know, you can't have a process inside your company and just begin that process when something like this happens, right? You have to build it off of what you already have. And I think, you know, I feel really good that we had a good foundation. Um, look, we have a lot of work to do and we're nowhere where we want to be, but having that foundation has really helped us, I think, through this, this what uh, you know, multiple crises, I, I would say. Margaret, I know you have uh, written uh, an article or two about uh, taking action and the need to take action in connection with the racial and social injustice issues that we've been all uh, managing through. Uh, would you be willing to share uh, just a couple of the actions that you've taken as a company? Sure. So, you know, I, I would say that the first thing we decided was we needed to take care of our employees first. And I think... Um, you know, the death of, uh, uh, of uh, George Floyd really, I think, just put into, uh, you know, video and kind of going through that. It was such a pivotal moment for many of our colleagues. And, you know, I would say it's one of the most sobering weeks I've ever had in my career. I've been through a lot of things, but I would say the stories and how people were feeling. I mean, there was just a lot of hurt um, out there. So we had a number of experts come in and we did a number of things around um, just having a conversation, talking through, how do you talk about this with your children? I think one of the most interesting things is we had a psychologist really work with um, all of our organizations. This was open to everyone on how do you deal with this? What do you see? What do you say to your children? We also had an event just for the children. Um, and then we had a number of speakers come in and just, you know, talk about the various things that were going on. And you know, this, again, comes from a culture where, you know, we are very inclusive and diverse. And, you know, I would say people were very willing to share their personal stories, which makes it even that much more real for everybody. Um, it, you know, then we put we put some grants out there. We said, look, let's put some money where, you know, where we can take action. So we did uh, $5 million towards uh, a number of funds that we're working on, social justice. We, we put another $2 million, um, around for small business. And this was really driven by the fact that, you know, one of the things that happened during this was small businesses were being impacted. Many, many were already impacted by the pandemic, but some had gotten destroyed through various, you know, social uh, riots or things like that. And so we actually went out and really tapped our, our small businesses and helped give them grants and loans to get them back on their feet. Um, and then, you know, I'd say that, you know, we're not stopping there. We had already been on a path where we wanted to make sure we were advancing uh, talent inside our organization. We actually started this last year. So we actually have been able to accelerate that in terms of, you know, I think, look, all of us know that our senior leadership teams are not representative of, 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 the, of the U.S., right? So how do we really take a stance and make some real proactive uh, development of our um, black and brown talent and allow them to really come up through the organization in a more accelerated way. So we're working on that. And then, you know, one lucky thing, I am very lucky that I have a very diverse board. 
That didn't happen by accident. It was something that I focused on when I created the board. So we've been able to leverage our diverse talent on our board to help have dialogue inside our company as well. Lastly, um, you know, we've held a, an event every year called our Diversity Symposium. Um, this year we changed it to Diversity Experience and we had, you know, close to 3,000 people participate in a three-day session totally focused on diversity and inclusion. We had a number of speakers there that were really, um, really more than um, engaging and touching on many, many different topics. Um, and it allowed us, again, to continue that conversation of what we're trying to achieve inside the company. And I think as you go through this, you, you got to deal with all the networks, not just one. And we, we were able to really um, double tap on a couple of really hot topics. And then lastly, you know, one of the things we did do when we uh, when the crisis hit, um, we actually created a, a whole series of teams to really accelerate certain things inside the company. And one of the teams that we did create was a diversity and inclusion team. And so we haven't just had the event and stopped. We still have a series of things that we're, we're really trying to change um, inside the company and outside the company. So I feel really good about the actions we've taken, but we still have, you know, more work to do to really uh, make sure that that we're representing what the U.S. looks like across yeah. all levels of our organization. Wow, that's that's terrific, and uh, and uh, certainly I know I know this is a long term a long term challenge for for all of us, but uh, you certainly have been very proactive in in taking on a number of different initiatives. So uh, I applaud you for doing that. Um, I'd like to move to the next value, which is which is innovation, and. Um, and today, if if we were if we were meeting face to face in our New York office, we would be conducting this interview in our innovation center, and and we call those the Protivity Inns. And um, I know you alluded to it in in your opening uh, comments, but um, I know as a company you have innovated a tremendous amount, especially in the years following the split off from uh, from GE. And um, I just would maybe like to know, you know, what do you do inside your organization to foster an innovative culture when you're not in a pandemic mode and, <laughs> and have to deal, operate on, on the fly? Yeah. So, um, so I, think, I think what we did when we broke off from GE, one of the things we had to really focus on was our technology, both our, basically our infrastructure and we did a lot of work early on to get the infrastructure up the curve to what we needed to do to really, what I'd say, really innovate. We created a number of innovation stations that are around the globe uh, in the U.S. where we have teams of people working on innovation in an agile fashion. You know, we've moved the company to agile uh, methodology, by the way, which has been phenomenal for us as we've gone through this crisis because it really allows you to stop having nine hour meetings and really get to the point of decision making and moving forward. And it's allowed those teams who were working in those innovation stations to take that, that uh, method and apply it as they're working from home. But, you know, I've been um, a, a staunch believer that the only way for this company to exist another hundred years is for us to really be innovating from every aspect of payments. And, you know, that's really how the customer interacts with us, how they apply for a credit card, where they apply and how simple that process can be. And really we've been working on that as well as, you know, bringing that process all the way through the whole servicing of, of the customer experience. Now we have to do that through partners. So in many cases we can't do that by ourselves. So I think, you know, one good example of innovation is really, we just rolled out uh, a Verizon program and, you know, we didn't first, first pandemic rollout, by the way, of uh, never rolled out a program of that magnitude. And, you know, a lot of the work that was being done was actually being done by their team at home and our team at home. And, you know, that innovation never stopped. And so I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm really proud of is, is the ability for, you know, our teams to really continue to take the, the methodology and the lesson and the things that we're working on. And we applied that same thinking to some of the things we had to do to move fast to get people home. Um, because, you know, we had a, we literally had to put together a whole toolkit where cus uh, our customer service reps came to pick it up, to bring it home, to set up their work at home uh, facility. You know, in India, we actually, actually had to deliver them to employees' houses because, 
if you and I think you have some employees in India, you know, they shut down and they literally gave people like two hours or three hours and said, okay, we're shutting down, uh, which, you know, pretty much everyone was caught off guard with that. But yeah. post that shutdown, we were able to get these, I guess, tokens. I mean, it's just an example of how innovative we got tokens. You could use so many tokens a day and we were delivering packages out to folks to get them to work at home. So, um, you know, I think innovation, it, it came, has come out in so many ways, but you know, in order for you to be a, a company who's going to be around, I mean, it's got to be the forefront of your thinking. You got to constantly be reinventing and thinking about new ways to do business um, going forward. Yeah, I think uh, innovation has certainly, uh, you know, propelled in terms of its importance, especially in the last six months. And I think, you know, some of the things you've talked about, uh, both empowerment. Um, of your team and the the agile approach to uh, to innovating, I think have become a whole lot more critical um, with the speed and the pace of change that we're all dealing with, and the fact that we didn't really recognize that we're going to be in this environment for as long as we're going to be. Um, and so, you know, we've got to we've got to change and be responsive to our customers and in the way that that they're doing business. And um, it sounds like you've certainly have done a great job of, of no, doing and I that. Think the consumers change through this. You know, we, we most of our cards are done through partnerships, through retail. And as you know, I'm sure like you, how, ma how many stores are you shopping in? Probably not a lot. Um, and if you do shop, you're really using technology to, you know, purchase on online or at home. Or, you know, even when you go out and go out to the supermarket now, you can even see you don't have to sign now. You know, many more people are looking at that tap and go kind of experience. And all those things are things we've built out. But frankly, it's been slower for the merchants to really take take this technology on because they have to make changes in their stores. Yeah. Um, I That's been a big shift too, right? Our ability to really continue to elevate things that we, we have built but maybe weren't getting bought into yet, but all of that is accelerating. You know, I think more and more people are not going to want to touch things. Um, I'm sure, you know, if you thought of yourself, how many times have you pulled out cash in the last couple of months? Probably not a lot. Yeah. Um, so we, we have to think through all of that as we think through the various ways consumers are uh, shopping and how they want their experiences different now. Agree. Agree. Um, let's shift to, integrity. Uh, integrity is um, our third uh, value at Protivity, and we, we believe that integrity and honesty is core to our culture, and, and our vision is actually to become the most trusted consulting firm. And so the interplay between integrity and trust, we, we view in, uh, in very high regard. And I know honesty is one of the values that uh, that's embedded in Synchrony's culture, and if not your your key value. And I'll just ask you, how does that play a role in your organization and in the future of work? Yeah, you know, this business has been through a lot. Um, and I think honesty for me is one that, you know, as an employee, I always held high. Like, you know, even when I was coming up the ranks, I think it's so important for us to be um, transparent to our organization and, and our customers too, right? It's both. It's not just one or the other. And I, it's a it's a value that I think as we've gone through the pandemic has been, I think, critically important. So I talked about the importance of communicating. I would tell you that we didn't have all the answers. And I think this is one thing I learned. Um, you know, at one point they were looking to sell our business in GE and there was a lot of just confusion. And I just kept getting up in front of people and talking about, okay, we don't know anything, but hang in there, do your job, you know, ha rah, rah. And I learned from that experience that, you know, it's okay to say you don't always know everything. And I, I do think sometimes, particularly as CEOs, we want to like look like we're all like buttoned up on every answer. And I think there, there the truth is we, we don't know all the answers. And particularly through this pandemic, there's no way we knew all the answers. Nobody's really experienced this before. Um, and I think, you know, having those sessions every week, you know, we, we started out initially with um, phone calls kind of set up, you know, where we do these big web phone call setups. I quickly said, look, we got to do video because people have to see us. People have to see our faces. 
and know that, you know, we're, we're like looking them in the eye, if you will, of yeah. what's happening. I, I, I realized how important that was. And then I think, you know, people want honest answers. You know, people mm-hmm. want, first of all, you have to trust your employees. Uh, and, you know, in a time like this where there's going to be positives and then there's going to be maybe some challenges that you have to face as a company, you have to be honest with them. And I, I truly believe you you build a culture off the fact that employees know we're going to we're going to tell them what's going on. And, you know, and when we don't know the answer, we're going to tell them we don't know the answer. But as soon as we know the answer, we're going to come back around to you. And then you have to follow through on that. Right. You can't you can't shy away from those types of situations. Um, you know, I think the other two pieces I'd say are really important as you're working through, you know, any challenging situation um, is really empathy. So really, you know, one, I'll give you an example of um, something that I think, you know, kind of came from, you know, this empathy thinking. Um, and, you know, I'm a woman, I had kids, I was a working mom, my kids are older now, thank goodness, I don't have to deal with all the <laughs> things everybody's dealing with. I, I joke about that all the time. Um, but, you know, one of the things my CIO, Carol, has, you know, three children. She has twins and a, and a young son who's like in fifth grade, I think. Um, and, you know, she and I talk a lot and she's like, Margaret, we really have to do something for the women there. I'm hearing a lot around. They're just they're just they're, they're just exhausted. And we talked about the fact that, you know, the summer was going to be very different for families. So we came up with this idea of synchrony camp. And we created this camp that is in, you know, was virtual and it had, you know, typical camp things like tie dyeing. And then it had things like learning sign language. So it was an incredible experience. And what we did is we actually had high school students and college students of our employees actually work as counselors in the camp. So they were allowed or capable of getting, uh, you know, putting, writing something on their resume to say, I did this. Uh, we now are expanding that to after school, uh, synchrony after school. So, you know, I think these are the things that come out of empathy of listening of like, okay, we got to do something for parents, right? Um, you know, and I think, you know, throughout all of this, because there's going to be pluses and minuses, you know, I did say we just launched a new uh, program around how synchrony works. And, you know, even through that, there are pluses and minuses. We have a lot of people really happy that they can work at home forever, I mean, we've allowed that as a choice for our company. And then there are other people who are like, I really want to come back to an office. And, you know, we got to make sure we're balancing out all those needs and, and listening to employees. So you know, I think, you know, empathy, listening and honesty are just really important points. Yeah. Well, I, you used a number of words that, that I think really surround, really reinforce the honesty and, and integrity value. I, I think humility, uh, transparency, and I know um, the empathy point uh, around making making our people feel like you know they're not the only ones in this on on their own, and that um, we don't always have all of the answers. And I you know we we followed your lead in, in a similar fashion by by having all of our meetings now. The meetings that I have with our team are all live meetings, and you know we we have open. Q and A with them and give them the opportunity to ask any questions that they have and and um, and try to report back to them as as quickly as as possible. So I, we're we're following a lot of your uh, a lot of your actions and, and concepts and uh, really appreciate that. So Margaret, um, I know our, our time is coming to a close. It's been um, an absolute pleasure uh, to be able to to have this dialogue with you. I think from uh, from everything that you've shared, um, it's no secret why Synchrony is a, a great place to work under under your leadership. And I, I really want to thank you for your your time today. Um, Synchrony is also a client of Protivity, so um, be remiss if I didn't thank you also for the business and uh, for you know providing a uh, level of confidence in in our firm uh, to be able to serve you. So have a great day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and um, and much success to you, uh, continued success going forward. And I want to thank you, Joe. I, I would say, and your team should know, that we actually did reach out to you in the midst of the pandemic uh, when we had some challenges. And um, I think we ended up figuring it out ourselves, but you were 
ready to stand up a team for us and help us through a number of things as we were working through our first virtual close, as if you recall. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much for the partnership and for your leadership. And, uh, you know, hopefully I, I'll continue to see you because we have a lot, a lot of work to do at St. John's. So thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Margaret.